In a cemetery outside Kingston lie a group of weathered tombstones. These are some of the first European settlers of Jamaica, key players in the island's history. And their tombstones are in Hebrew. They're part of a generation of Spanish and Portuguese Jews who lived in secret, hunted by the Inquisition, who'd had their bodies broken and their property confiscated by the church. And when their homeland expelled them in 1492, they traveled to anywhere that would have them to the Netherlands, the Ottoman Empire, and even here at the edge of the known world. Many of these expelled Jews were maritime traders, skilled in sailing, navigating, and cartography, tools they quickly turned towards serving their new governments, wrestling back their stolen fortunes, and getting the one thing they desired from Spain the most, revenge. Because above the Hebrew lettering, these tombstones carry another mark, the skull and crossbones. Thanks so much to CuriosityStream for helping us keep history afloat. Before we begin our swashbuckling historical tale, a quick caveat. Tracking piracy amongst Jewish people expelled from Iberia is a fairly new area of study. And when Rob started researching for this episode, he found a bunch of errors being passed around as fact. So, just a heads up to please be a little careful with what you read in online articles or even books on this topic. Similarly, since this is a new and fairly obscure area, it's possible that details might change as other historians further their research. But we still felt the topic was worth exploring, since it's a unique opportunity to discuss Jewish diaspora through a unique and interesting lens. So with all that out of the way, gather round me hearties and lend me your buccaneers. Sorry, not sorry. It's March of 1492, and the newly unified Kingdom of Spain made two monumental moves. The first was to issue the Alhambra Decree, ordering all Jewish persons in Spanish territory to sell their property, settle their affairs, and leave. They had four months, with a final deadline of July 31st. The second was to sponsor a voyage of discovery by a Genoese mariner by the name of Cristóbal Colombo, better known in the English-speaking world as Christopher Columbus. At the time, the Alhambra Decree was considered the more consequential of the two. In fact, Columbus's own diary of the voyage began by noting that he received his orders for the expedition, quote, in the same month in which their majesties issued the edict that all Jews should be driven out of the kingdoms and their territories. In an ironic twist, Columbus's expedition actually left port just days after the expulsion deadline, meaning he likely loaded his supplies within sight of the stream of displaced families boarding ships to leave. Though, his fate would be strangely intertwined with theirs, and in later years, his family's personal rule over Jamaica would give Jewish refugees a safe harbor beyond the Inquisition's reach. But taking a step back for a moment, we should explore the question, why at the cusp of the 16th century did Spain and Portugal suddenly expel Jewish and Muslim populations that, in the case of the Jews, had lived there since the Roman Empire? To put it simply, there's no actual way to put it simply. In fact, historians still debate which of the host of reasons played the biggest role and what the crown's motives were. But at its most basic, it was about the Spanish co-monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, trying to create a sense of national unity through religion. See, until 1479, what we now know as Spain was actually three kingdoms, Castile, Aragon, and Granada, the last of the Islamic kingdoms in Iberia. But then when the heirs of two of those kingdoms, Ferdinand and Isabella, married and eventually inherited the separate thrones, they dynastically unified the Kingdom of Spain. Then in January of 1492, they managed to finally capture Granada and complete the Reconquista, a multi-decade project of reconquering the Islamic kingdoms of Iberia. But this presented what they saw as a problem. Due to the long history of Iberia, their kingdom now contained a large number of Jews and Muslims, people they'd specifically promised not to persecute when they took Granada. Complicating this issue was a large number of Jews who had converted to Christianity, the conversos, or new Christians. Many of these were legacies of anti-Semitic massacres that swept Spain in 1391, when mobs rampaged through Jewish communities, murdering any who refused to be baptized and forcing 200,000 Jews to convert, leaving only 100,000 practicing Jews in Spain. Some conversos genuinely considered themselves Catholic after a few generations, while others identifying as Christian still kept ties to the Jewish community or cultural practices and a minority became what were called Muranos, or in modern works, crypto-Jews, people who appeared to convert but continued to practice Judaism in secret. And finally, there was also the Moriscos, or Muslim converts. Now, at the beginning of their reign, 
Ferdinand and Isabella viewed themselves as protectors of the Jews, pushing forward policies meant to shield them from mobs of Catholics whipped up by anti-Semitic preachers. But their policies amounted to keeping the Jews safe by also keeping them separate. Heavily Jewish districts, not exclusively Jewish before, became ghettos with curfews. Jews were barred from certain trades, had to wear visual signifiers of their status, and could not hold office over Christians. The idea was to make life as a Jew so difficult they would convert. But what really concerned the crown were the conversos, the new Christians. Ferdinand and Isabella constantly worried that the Jews or the crypto-Jews were, in the terms of the time, Judaizing these new converts, causing them to return to their old beliefs. Though even secure converts were not safe from periodic massacres. For example, in 1473, a girl of a wealthy converso family disposed of some water out a window and splashed a sculpture of the Virgin Mary, triggering days of rioting and murder. Despite this, many Jews and conversos had a thriving middle class and even some served in the court. Many Jews worked in the maritime trade and were well known as navigators and cartographers. But eventually, this success only brought more jealousy and official scrutiny. To inquire into the spiritual health of these conversos, in 1478, Ferdinand and Isabella appealed to Pope Sixtus IV to open an inquisition, a type of temporary trial by questioning body meant to root out heresy and convince those with wayward beliefs to confess and rejoin the church. This, they thought, would stop the mob violence. Now, inquisitions had happened periodically in the Middle Ages, but the Spanish Inquisition would become something entirely different. A permanent bureaucracy that existed for over three centuries, essentially operating as a secret police. Inquisitors would arrive in an area and announce their presence, inviting anyone to confess to heretical beliefs or Judaizing. They'd also collect secret denunciations against members of the community, make arrests based on them, and hold the accused for months or even years during which time the accused was supported by the revenue of their property, which the Inquisition also seized, then followed a trial which might involve judicial torture and a sentencing. A conviction could mean imprisonment, years below deck in a slave galley, or participation in an auto de fe, a grotesque public execution ritual where the convicted were paraded in ceremonial clothing before, in the best case, repenting, or in the worst case, being strangled or burned at the stake. In other words, Jews couldn't win. If they were openly Jewish, they risked being murdered by a mob, and if they did convert, the Inquisition could arrest, torture, and execute them on the flimsiest of evidence. And then in 1492, the Grand Inquisitor convinced Ferdinand that having Jewish communities living openly in Spain was just too big of a temptation for the conversos, so all of the Jews and Muslims would have to go. Which circles us back to the Alhambra Decree. Four months to either convert or leave Spain. And the Jews leaving would have to sell all of their property. But then, because it was forbidden to export gold, silver, horses, or arms, in these transactions, they would have to accept other merchandise or bills of sale that might not be accepted elsewhere. Many lost everything, either from being swindled on their way out or robbed by ship captains. Lines of weeping families jammed the roads to the ports. But where would they even go? England and France had already expelled their Jews, and Poland was a perilous voyage away. So many, rejected by Catholic Spain, turned to the relative tolerance of the Ottoman Empire, the Netherlands, and as soldiers and settlers at the edge of the Spanish Empire, where these abused, disaffected sailors and merchants could live in a measure of safety while turning their skills toward a new goal, making the Spanish pay. So set sail with us next episode, where we'll meet the Jewish pirates who teamed up with the Ottomans to battle Spain for control of the Mediterranean. We'll walk the decks with Sinan Reis, or Sinan the Chief, who served as the right-hand man to the infamous corsair Barbarossa, and meet Samuel Palacci, a rabbi who took to the sea to become a diplomat, spy, and illustrious pirate. Till then, though, see you on the horizon. But you know, I do think it's time we blow this scene, get everybody and their stuff together, okay? Three, two, one, let's jam! What the heck am I talking about? Oh, I don't know, maybe just a little episode of the Nebula original series working titles I crafted about the beauty and effectiveness of the Cowboy Bebop opening sequence. Seriously, have you seen the opening? It's phenomenal. I would argue, and I do, that it might be the finest example of priming your mind for a show in television history. Now, I've been wanting to do a video essay on that series for so long, and I'm super excited that Nebula helped make my space bounty hunting dreams come true. And you can check it out right now over on Nebula, 
the By Creators for Creators platform we became a part of earlier this year. And in addition to original content like my aforementioned Bebop breakdown, and our extra extra history on Tipu Sultan we've been telling you about, you'll find tons of other original content by YouTube's other top educational creators. Folks like Legal Eagle, Jordan Harrod, and Jacob Geller. And because our sponsor CuriosityStream believes so much in this edutainment ecosystem, they've partnered with us at Nebula to create a phenomenal two-for-one deal. For less than $15, you get access to both Nebula and CuriosityStream for an entire year. And that's not a trial, that's not a sample. It's the whole massive catalog of creative content, all there at your fingertips. And you know, one Curiosity Stream doc I was really enjoying the other day, to the surprise of no one who knows me, is The Secret World of Lego, that has a ton of info on my favorite secretive toy company that's taken over the world. Like, did you know that the Lego minifake population now outnumbers the human population? Pretty scary. But still no Bebop sets, huh? Where's my Swordfish 2, Lego? For shame. <clears throat> oh, sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, best of all, when you sign up with our link at curiositystream.com slash extra credits, not only will you get a year of all of this cool content across both platforms for the discounted price of $14.97, but you'll also be directly helping out our channel in the process. And that's something our whole crew really appreciates. I don't want to brag, but Ahmed, Ziad, Turk, Alicia, Bramble, Casey, Muscia, Dominic, Valenciana, Gunnar, Clovis, Kyle, Murgatroyd, and O'Reels1 are fantastic legendary patrons. Thank you.